Hello, everyone. This is Kelly Eversold, Executive Director of the International Wheat Genome Sequencing Consortium, and we're joined today by Edward Akinoff from Kansas State University. So before we get started with his webinar, I'd like to give you a little bit of an overview of the IWGSC. <clears throat> So we are a nonprofit organization with uh, operating in or having members in 70 countries. We have eight sponsors, uh, a number of institutes and companies are engaged and over 3000 members. Our webinar series is sponsored of course by our, by our sponsors and we'd like to thank them for their support. I will make a note that Kansas Wheat um, who also I think has supported Edward is, is our longest standing sponsor and we really do appreciate the vision and leadership that Kansas has shown for the entire history of the International Wheat Genome Sequencing Consortium. Our vision uh, as part of 2.0, what we call IWGSC 2.0 is to really enhance breeding through an increased understanding of the molecular basis of traits and their allelic diversity. We have a number of activities that we're continuing to try to work on this year despite the lab closures and the uh, challenges of working during uh, COVID, but we are continuing to expand the Arbor Biosciences collaboration. We will be releasing before too long, uh, hopefully by the beginning of the year, a new IWGSC RefSec V2.1, as well as a man manual and a new functional annotation of, of the reference. And that'll also be annotation version 2.1. And we are still trying to find funding for the reference sequences of at least of the eight land races that represent the breadth of wheat diversity. We're also trying to uh, bring in other genome sequences of elite wheat varieties and other genomic resources to be part of the IWGSC <coughs> repository. And I want to thank Edward for providing pre-publication access to the work that he's going to be presenting today. That's always very helpful to the community. Our next webinar will be genome-specific primer design with polymarker. Uh, <clears throat> Ricardo Ramirez-Gonzalez from the John Ennis Center will be giving us that webinar. Be sure and sign up for that. And uh, you can go to the registration page to go to webinar or you can actually do that on our IWGSC website. So just a reminder, the web, this webinar is being recorded and will be posted on the IWGSC YouTube channel in a few days. You can subscribe to the channel so that you never miss a new upload. The presentation will be followed by a Q&A period. If you have any questions, please submit your questions in the Q&A panel. Do not use the chat. Uh, for questions that you would like to ask Edward. Uh, you can use the chat to talk with fellow attendees or to the organizers. You can already download both of our presentations in the uh, handouts in the handout panel. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Edward, who's going to talk with us today about <clears throat> differential chromatin accessibility map as a new resource for studying wheat genome function and genotype to trait relationships. <clears throat> I would also, before we get started, also like to say that Edward is one of the ones who's pioneering the work in genome editing, and it was great to see that the Nobel Prize today uh, went for genome to the two leaders of genome editing. And, in California. So with that, I'll turn it over to Edward. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, okay, uh, hello everyone. Um, and uh, I would like to thank organizers for uh, inviting me and giving me a chance to talk about our work. Uh, we do uh, with um, uh, with developing new functional genomic resources for studying with genome function and genotype to trait relationships, 
And uh, this work has been done as a part of the wheat cap, uh, or US wheat cap project, uh, where we are trying to use newly developed uh, genomic resources, such as reference genome developed by the IWGSC, uh, to uh, create, uh, to, 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 uh, to develop resources for uh, post-genomic analysis uh, of, um, uh, of wood genome function. Uh, and uh, I, I would like to, okay, yeah, you, normally uh, if uh, we, uh, in, in genetic mapping studies, uh, when we try to connect uh, genetic variation in the genome with the phenotype using simple statistical models, uh, however, these statistical models uh, actually fail to capture the entire complexity of interaction, the interactions that lies uh, between uh, genome and the phenotype. And uh, the, here, this slide shows the, uh, the theoretical uh, additional dimensions that lie between genome and phenotype. Uh, and here you may like uh, such as uh, epigenomic uh, variation, uh, transcriptomic variation, proteome, and metabolome. And uh, if you, if we would like to understand uh, completely uh, the entire complexity uh, of uh, uh, processes that uh, that lies between uh, genetic variation and phenotype, we need to characterize these additional dimensions. Uh, and uh, uh, with the development of new genomic resources uh, and the diverse populations that are now resequenced and phenotype, uh, now we have powerful tools for connecting genomic and phenotypic variation. And uh, the, this slide shows uh, uh, some of the resources that are already available, uh, and some, but doesn't list all of them, of course. Um, uh, and we already have uh, multiple reference genomes for diploid, tetraploid, and gexaploid wheat. Uh, we have large populations of, uh, of wheat accessions uh, that are uh, heavily genotyped and phenotyped. Uh, that, and combined together, these resources significantly accelerated genetic uh, dissection of uh, uh, genome to phenome uh, relationships. However, uh, to uh, understand mechanistically uh, the effect of gene genetic effects of individual mutations uh, on uh, phenotype, uh, we need to integrate additional uh, types of genomic data. And uh, <clears throat> here, first, uh, the, in, in the WheatCap project, uh, we work on uh, developing resources that uh, would uh, uh, contribute um, to better understanding of uh, genome to phenome maps and uh, i would like to start uh, with talking about our work on uh, characterizing epigenome and uh, for that purpose we uh, have uh, decided we decided to uh, develop, to characterize chromatin accessibility uh, across the uh, entire wood genome and uh, if you, and chromatin accessibility provides actually quite a holistic, comprehensive view of uh, functionally active chromatin, uh, and uh, where the regions of the genome that are functionally active and that ha that have expressed genes, or those regions that could act as a, as a, uh, regulators of gene expression, uh, they usually have open chromatin, uh, which could be characterized using chromatin accessibility assays. Or, or in the cases when the gene is suppressed and the chromatin become less accessible, uh, then uh, you have um, you know you have pretty compact uh, uh, compact uh, chromatin that could be uh, again uh, easily characterized using uh, chromatin accessibility assays. Uh, in our work, we used um, uh, uh, differential chromatin accessibility assay that is based on the digest with the micrococal nuclease uh, with the, the two concentration of the micrococal nuclease with the where you can we, we use a low concentration of uh, micro MNAs uh, to perform light digest and uh, we, or you use uh, lots of uh, MNAs so that you uh, perform complete digest of chromatin to the level of individual nucleosomes and uh, here on this slide 
uh, you can see that by applying these two uh, levels of MNAs digest, you can uh, classify chromatin into uh, different uh, states, uh, uh, such as uh, MNAs resistant state, where the uh, chromatin is uh, more compact, closed, and resistant to MNAs digest, or to MNAs sensitive state, where uh, chromatin is more open and therefore easily accessible to microcopal nuclease that can now digest it. Uh, and uh, then uh, the genomic libraries prepared these uh, treatments uh, could be uh, sequenced by using next generation sequencing. Uh, for that purpose, we use Illumina. And then uh, risk uh, are mapped to the reference genome. And based on the uh, depth of read coverage that you get uh, from uh, both uh, uh, MNA treatments, you can um, uh, start uh, classifying genome uh, into uh, various chromatin states from the most open chromatin state to the uh, most uh, closed uh, MNA resistant state. And uh, uh, this uh, slide uh, shows the chromosome level uh, chromatin accessibility, uh, uh, chromatin accessibility of, for the weed genome. And on this slide, uh, you can see uh, just as an example chromosome 2 and uh, which shows uh, uh, the distribution of uh, chromatin accessibility scores along the chromosomes and you can see that chromatin accessibility at the tips of the chromosomes is uh, higher than the chromatin accessibility closer to the paracentromeric regions uh, and uh, if we, we can all we also use um, uh, uh, statistical analysis that allows to segment genome into uh, closed and open chromatin uh, region, regions. And uh, at the bottom of the slide, you can see the proportion of the genome that is occupied by open chromatin and by closed chromatin. And you can see that they show inverse relationship uh, with the tips of the chromosome having lots of open chromatin, uh, which is uh, uh, whereas the centromeric region is rich for the closed chromatin. And of course, uh, if you look at this uh, global pattern, chromosomal patterns, they actually follow, um, follow the distribution of gene density, gene expression, recombination, and genetic diversity. Uh, in previous studies performed by uh, members of the uh, IWGSC, uh, the weak chromosomes have been uh, split into five uh, uh, large regions uh, based on the uh, combination of various features such as gene density, gene expression combination, and genetic diversity. And here at the top of, to, at the top slide, you can see uh, the proportions of uh, very of these features, uh, uh, how how these features are distributed across these uh, five uh, chromosomal regions. Uh, so, and you can see that uh, chromatin uh, accessibility actually uh, perfectly uh, consistent with the distribution of these features uh, and uh, which again uh, indicates that the data that we get actually does reflect the functional and structural organization of uh, wheat chromosomes. <clears throat> uh, so uh, in our analysis we uh, split genome in uh, different uh, uh, segments and then analyze them separately. And what we did find, uh, we, we split genome into uh, regions that are occupied by genes and by or by the regulatory regions of the genes. Uh, here you can see the uh, regions uh, 500 base pair upstream of every gene model. Uh, and also we split the, and then we also analyzed chromatin accessibility of the intergenic regions. And you can see that the uh, chromatin accessibility of gene bodies uh, and as well as the uh, regulatory regions actually vary quite broadly but in average uh, tend to remain quite uniform along the uh, along the chromosome along this uh, across these five uh, five chromosomal regions um, whereas if you look at the uh, distribution of chromatin accessibility of the intergenic regions it follows the uh, this uh, the general pattern that you saw before, uh, where the tips of the chromosome uh, tend to be more open, whereas uh, in the centromeric regions tend to be more closed. Uh, so 
So essentially, you can see, uh, in spite, so essentially what it tells is that for gene, in spite of uh, the gene is located in the centromeric region, very centromeric region, uh, it still have the same open chromatin state as those genes that are located at the uh, telomeric regions. Uh, whereas the intergenic region actually show this gradient uh, uh, of uh, chromatin accessibility across. Uh, so, <clears throat> uh, and uh, uh, we actually decided to look at this pattern and then what we did find that, uh, of course, in most of the ca cases, the uh, proportion of the region uh, that is occupied by uh, transposable elements uh, that, are, uh, that represent nearly 90% of the wheat genome uh, actually have major impact on uh, chromatin accessibility score. And here you may see the proportion of the gypsy transposable element, and then uh, you can see that uh, as the proportion of gypsy is increasing, the chromatin accessibility of the region goes down. Uh, however, in spite of that, uh, we still see the same pattern of chromatin accessibility across five chromosomal regions, even for the transposable elements. Those transposable elements that are located, even from the same class, uh, that, that are located at the tips of the chromosomes, they are actually more um, uh, open than uh, those copies of the same transposable ele element that are located closer to the uh, centromeric regions. So essentially, you have this uh, global pattern that has actually override the uh, chromatin accessibility of individual elements. <clears throat> uh, and uh, another factor that impacts the chromatin accessibility of transposable element uh, is uh, elements. Uh, uh, is their uh, proximity to the genes. Uh, those transposable elements that are located close to the genes, they tend to be more open than uh, the members from the same uh, transposable element family that are located elsewhere. And here you could see examples of three uh, types of transposable element, gypsy, copia, and cacta, uh, that, uh, and then their chromatin accessibility uh, depending on whether they are located uh, close to in the promoter region of the genes uh, uh, within 2KB from the coding sequence or uh, farther away. And you can see that the chromatin accessibility of those transposable elements that are located close to the close to the genes, uh, it, it tend, to, they tend to be more open. Um, <clears throat> uh, so, uh, and of course, uh, these, uh, uh, you, you know, the, the the, uh, it looks like that uh, genes and the transposable elements that are located uh, close to each other, they actually have a mutual impact on, uh, the, uh, on, the, on the chromatin accessibility. Uh, and uh, uh, these interactions, uh, of course, impact the uh, levels of gene expression. And uh, here we show that the depending on whether the gene has transposable element inserted into the regulatory region or it doesn't have it, uh, the uh, uh, chromatin accessibility of gene body also changes. In, in case if transposable element is located inside of the, uh, uh, of the promoter region, the chromatin accessibility of the gene itself uh, uh, is, is getting reduced, and then it impacts the level of gene expression. The level of expression is also going down, and uh, also you have opposite effect. When you don't have transposable element in the promoter region, then the expression level of the gene is getting uh, higher. Uh, and uh, uh, if you look at the uh, distribution, uh, the more fine scale distribution of chromatin states relative to the uh, gene model, uh, here you may see that the uh, differential chromatin accessibility scores uh, actually showing this uh, classical pattern where the uh, where here you can see for, on the left the zero stands for the beginning of the coding sequence and you can see that the promoter region uh, showing the most open chromatin state and then you have a sharp drop in chromatin accessibility just close to the gene and, uh, and then it go, chromatin accessibility goes back again to, the, to, to higher open state. Uh, and uh, this, um, uh, so essentially this pattern just indicates that 
uh, promoter regions tend to have the highest level of chromatin accessibility. And we also, uh, if you look at the level of gene expression, you see a pretty good correlation uh, with the uh, chromatin, uh, with the level of chromatin accessibility and the average gene expression level, uh, which tend to increase. And uh, uh, when you take a subset of uh, those genes in the we genome that are duplicated due to the whole genome duplication, and we call these genes gomeologous genes, uh, gomeologous gene copies. Uh, so, so you can, uh, what we did, we looked at the a difference in the level of expression of the duplicated gomeo with gene copies and the difference in the level of chromatin accessibility between the duplicated genes. And, you, and here you may again clearly see this relationship, which tells us that depending uh, that the difference, uh, uh, difference in the expression levels of gomeologous genes depends on the uh, is based on the difference of uh, in chromatin accessibility uh, of the promoter regions. So, um, uh, however, uh, uh, we went further than we uh, uh, calculated the so-called MNA sensitive footprints or uh, MSF regions that are showing extremely high levels of chromatin accessibility. They are actually outliers uh, of chromatin accessibility scores. And uh, we looked at the distribution across the wheat genome. Uh, and we found that uh, they are enriched uh, around the genes. Uh, of course, majority uh, of the genes uh, have uh, um, MSF uh, located within the, within the promoter region. Uh, here, uh, here you may see uh, we found that 86% of the genes have uh, at least one uh, MSF uh, located within 2KB of the coding sequence. Uh, however, out of 177 megabase of open chromatin in the Wii genome, um, uh, which represent 1.26% of the genome, very small fraction, most of that is located within the intergenic regions with actually 67% located uh, within, the, uh, within the transposable elements that occupy, uh, again, as I said, 90% of the we genome. Uh, and uh, uh, here you may actually, uh, which actually suggests that the expansion of uh, the transposable element families in the we genome uh, actually looks like uh, might have strong impact on uh, regulation of genome function. <clears throat> so uh, further, now we have the, uh, we, we classified with genome into the uh, regions of open and closed chromatin, uh, but uh, then further we wanted to genetically assess uh, uh, the relevance of uh, this information for uh, connecting a genetic variation with the phenotype. And for that purpose, we used uh, a genomic data that we generated in our previously, recently finished uh, 1000 with exome sequencing project, uh, where we resequence using exome capture 1000 genetically and geographically diverse with accessions collected across the world. Uh, these panels have high uh, SNP uh, 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 density. Uh, we have more than 7 million SNPs uh, mapped to the uh, mapped uh, to the we genome, and uh, we have the phenotyping data for a number of agronomic traits. And uh, what we did, we used this data to partition uh, genetic variants so for these agronomic traits. And uh, for doing so, we uh, we actually took these 7 million SNPs and then we put, uh, and based on the chromatin, on the location in the genome and the chromatin accessibility of that specific genomic regions, we actually classified uh, all these SNPs into uh, sets uh, that are coming from the regions with the really open chromatin and then uh, those SNPs that come from the regions with the closed chromatin. Uh, and, um, uh, and here you may see the results uh, where the green bars correspond to the SNP sets that come from the regions. Uh, it's a 20, uh, you know, uh, upper 20 percentile of the chromatin score distribution, uh, which correspond to the most open chromatin. 
Uh, and the gray bars correspond to the S&P size that come from the lower 20 percentile of uh, uh, chromatin accessibility distribution. And, uh, uh, and here we plotted the proportion of genetic variants explained by, the, by these two S&P sets coming from the closed and uh, open chromatin. And you, might see, you may see that in almost, uh, for almost every phenotypic trait that we analyze in our study, we actually have substantial increase in the proportion of genetic variants uh, explained by uh, SNPs that are located within the uh, open chromatin region, which suggests that the uh, these uh, you know these SNPs are coming from the functional functionally active genomic regions, and likely these SNPs would have some impact on genome function, maybe on gene expression or uh, gene structure, and therefore the impact on phenotype is much more substantial than the impact of SNPs that are located in the uh, heterochromatic closed genomic regions. So, so essentially, uh, this, uh, this analysis tells us that chromatin accessibility is a good predictor of this effect of SNP variation on phenotype, and uh, that the developed map of chromatin states across the genome could be useful for prioritizing SNPs, um, uh, probably in genomic selection uh, studies or detecting uh, SNPs that uh, causal SNPs uh, uh, from uh, gene mapping studies or genome-wide association mapping studies. <clears throat> uh, and uh, we uh, used uh, the chromatin accessibility data that we developed uh, for uh, actually uh, developing some tools uh, that are available uh, uh, in brain from brain genes. Uh, we've got uh, raw, uh, raw chromatin accessibility data could be downloaded also from the URGIO website. Uh, and um, uh, I'd like to, you to pay attention to these uh, two tools that are actually currently under development. Uh, links could change, but uh, certainly the, you could find them in these specific databases. Uh, here we are trying to, use, to set up a tool uh, so, that, so that, the, uh, that would allow filtering uh, SNP data sets that are developed uh, in various genomic projects uh, based on the uh, chromatin accessibility scores. Uh, and uh, uh, Clay Burkett and uh, Jan Janik, uh, they, they work on developing uh, this kind of tool for T3 database. Uh, it's it's an official wheat cap database where we place all the phenotypic and genotypic data from the project. and uh, uh, Tanya Shon, uh, he, uh, he, he has developed a tool for filtering 1,000 SNP, uh, 1,000 uh, wheat exome project SNP data sets based on chromatin accessibility scores. Okay, <clears throat> now I'd like to switch to the uh, another dimension of genome to phenome map, uh, which is the transcriptome dimension. And uh, uh, tell you a little bit about, uh, this is just some preliminary data, we are still in the process of understanding of what we have. Uh, uh, try to, uh, try, we, we are trying to test how we can actually combine uh, the epigenomic data with the transcriptomic data to better understand uh, genome to phenome relationships. And uh, uh, of course, due, due, some, uh, due to the efforts of the members of the IWGRC, uh, GSC, uh, uh, lots of resources for functional genomics have been developed. And this is uh, one of the resources uh, uh, that uh, currently is available, which is the transcriptional atlas of the wheat genome. It's a very, it's, it's an excellent research that, uh, excellent resource that, uh, provides gene expression uh, data for across multiple tissues of several uh, weak lines. Um, however, uh, but, but of course, uh, here we, what we, we do understand how the gene expression changes across the developmental stages, stress treatments, and uh, uh, across different tissues. Uh, but yet, uh, what we, uh, we still lack, we still need to understand uh, how gene expression uh, genetically controlled in the wheat genome. And that's where we, uh, we try to focus. Uh, and uh, for that purpose, we start working on developing uh, resources and uh, characterizing um, uh, variation that uh, would have impact 
on a gene expression in the wood genome. Uh, and uh, in, in other words, we perform so-called uh, EQTL mapping study, uh, where we generated RNA-seq data for the first panel of wheat accessions, and then we performed genome-wide association mapping of variants that uh, would uh, impact gene expression levels. And uh, here you may, for example, just see one example where you have a SNP that have impact on the expression of one of the genes, and uh, those accessions that have uh, SNP allele G, they have high level of gene expression, whereas if they have uh, allele A, then the expression of that particular gene is lower, and which would say, which would indicate that, uh, yes, we have variant that is impacting, somehow linked with the gene expression level, and uh, depending on the relative uh, location of the SNP variant and the uh, gene, we can classify the uh, these EQTL into cis-EQTL or trans-EQTL, uh, and then uh, uh, map it to the genome. And uh, here's, uh, we, uh, in our study, identified about 30,000 EQTL that regulate expression of about 8,000 8, genes. Uh, and here you may see a classical uh, EQTL map where on the y-axis you see the location of the gene, and uh, along the x-axis you see the distribution of SNPs. And then uh, you can see that the, this diagonal line would uh, correspond to the uh, uh, like large number of cis EQTL that are located close to the genes, and uh, they impact their gene expression levels, uh, which is uh, usually what you see in most of the EQTL studies. Uh, indicating that you have lots of variation in the promoter region that impact the uh, gene expression levels. Uh, so, uh, but here we wanted to actually take a look what's the relationship between the chromatin accessibility states and the distribution of the EQTL. And here you know, on the left side, uh, I, I, I'm showing you the uh, distributed density of the EQTL relative to the uh, transcription start site. Uh, and you can see that the, uh, most of the EQTL allocated in the promoter regions with some of the EQTL being located far away and they're probably in, uh, located either within the distant uh, uh, cis-regulatory regions or they might be just simply in linkage disequilibrium uh, with the uh, variant of the uh, gene uh, that, uh, that, that they are connected with. Uh, how, uh, but if you compare the distribution of the chromatin accessibility scores uh, relative to the transcription start site, you also see <clears throat> that chromatin accessibility actually mirroring distribution of EQTL, which uh, again indicates, uh, which is consistent with our prior studies, which indicates that most of the functional variation with a possible functional impact on gene expression is actually mostly located within the uh, open chromatin region. Uh, and uh, uh, this knowledge actually, this information now uh, allows us to identify uh, uh, regulatory regions of the genome and then identify regulatory elements and uh, to better understand what's actually driving variation in gene expression uh, levels. <clears throat> and uh, we further went to confirm these uh, uh, results and uh, what we looked at we look at the enrichment of the EQTL in the regions of open chromatin. Uh, and uh, here uh, you see that, uh, you know, we plotted the uh, enrichment uh, of EQTL relative to the background uh, level uh, in uh, regions with the open chromatin, open chromatin one, two, three, and four, just correspond to uh, different types of genomic data that, uh, we, we, that, that was used to identify regions with open chromatin, uh, we combine data uh, based on the uh, MNAs profiling, DNAs1, uh, then uh, various types of uh, epigenetic modification of uh, DNA uh, and uh, epigenetic modification of the, uh, of the histones. And uh, here you may see that more EQTL is strongly enriched in the regions with open chromatin and then severely depleted in the regions that are heterochromatic uh, and have closed chromatin. Uh, well, and of course, uh, you know, uh, what is important for us is to try to understand uh, how we can actually connect this um, SNP variation uh, with, the, with the phenotype and the, how this information can help us to better understand how the, uh, gene the, how the phenotypic traits are controlled and the uh, which pathways are involved in controlling variation in trait. And uh, 
And uh, this actually slide just, uh, you know, shows like the, the, the general idea how it might actually work out. Uh, uh, you know, you hope that you have a SNP variant that would impact the level that controls the level of gene expression. And then, very, and then at the, and the variation in the gene expression uh, would have impact on the trait of interest. Um, so, uh, however, these relationships are sometimes difficult to infer. Uh, and the one thing, of course, uh, you know, easiest thing to do is to just you know, go into the GWAS studies and then check, well, uh, how many of the significant marker trait associations you identified in GWAS are actually uh, uh, enriched for the uh, EQTL uh, expression, expression QTL. And uh, it turned out that in most of the most of the GWAS signals are in reach for it, so EQTL, especially cis EQTL. And uh, uh, this is not something completely new. This was found in prior GWAS studies in plants and in animals and especially in humans, uh, uh, which actually indicates that yes, uh, EQTL uh, information does uh, actually contribute uh, to. Uh, variation the phenotypic traits, and therefore this information is relevant. Uh, uh, however, uh, co connecting uh, uh, directly EQTL with the traits uh, uh, can be a bit complicated. And uh, with uh, geneticists, uh, human geneticists, uh, actually were working on uh, developing various approaches how to do that. And uh, one of the ways how it could be done is uh, to develop uh, sophisticated models that the way you can jointly model uh, variation in the genome expression and uh, uh, the, the, uh, the trait uh, and variation in the trait. Uh, and here you may see, for example, SNP, uh, Z, uh, which you know denoted here as Z, uh, might have impact on the level of gene expression uh, of gene X. And at the same time, this SNP actually could impact the uh, you know, variation in the phenotypic trait Y, uh, but and the effect of the gene expression uh, on the trait is denoted here as effect X Y. And then uh, you can actually uh, there are models that allows you to model jointly uh, this type of data where, where the and then in, in by applying these models you can actually assess the effect of gene expression on the trait um, by taking into account. The, uh, also uh, in, information about the uh, EQTL, uh, uh, EQTL and the um, uh, trait associated SNPs. And we have done that for a number of traits. And then uh, what we did, we actually uh, de uh, took a gene co-expression networks and then we placed uh, on this gene co-expression network those genes that are identified in the, by joint modeling of EQTL and the trait. Uh, and uh, you may see, and here with the red dots, you can see how these significant as uh, associations are distributed across the network. And I'd like just to pay attention to one of the networks, which is actually well known and uh, characterized before in wheat and in rice, and uh, and uh, which actually includes a set of genes that are involved in regulation of heading data and uh, and the number of spikes per spike. Uh, and it uh, does include uh, one of the well-known genes uh, uh, involved in regulation of flowering called L3, L flowering free, uh, which actually indicates that uh, yes, these kind of approaches are actually quite valid and then help you to identify uh, pathways and the sets of genes that are controlling the trade. Um, so uh, if, uh, we're just uh, like uh, getting closer to the end of my talk. Uh, by uh, here we show that we by integrating genomic data from multiple dimensions of the genome to genome map, uh, we can actually start dissecting the uh, regulatory regions, genes, and pathways that contribute to uh, variation in uh, important uh, agronomic traits and weed. Um, okay, and uh, <clears throat> now I would like just uh, well. Just talk a little bit uh, about uh, how this information could be used. Uh, now, with the availability of the reference sequence, we can actually connect, identify genes and pathways um, uh, with the variation in traits, uh, in traits and functional data from other crops. 
and uh, and uh, also and this analysis actually help us uh, to uh, identify targets that we can use for either breeding uh, or uh, use uh, modern genome editing technologies to actually modify these targets and then uh, 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 obtain a variation that might be useful for uh, breeding uh, and uh, uh, and and uh, I would like just to um, show you how this kind of knowledge can can, can be used. Uh, and as we will advance further and then start putting all the data together, we'll start getting better and better understanding of the biological pathways that contribute to variation in the traits. And then this would allow us to uh, perform targeting engineering of traits by applying uh, CRISPR-based genome editing. Uh, and uh, create alleles that would have expected specific effect on the network and on the connected trade. And uh, here's the example of the network that is developed based on the comparison, uh, intergenomic comparisons, and then comp compiling various types of functional uh, genomic data and the genetic mapping studies. And uh, uh, here, uh, you could see the you know sets of genes that are connected that are that somehow connected uh, with the phenotypic traits, such phenotypic traits as uh, variation in grain size, weight, uh, number of grains per spike, uh, uh, with the number of chillers and the photosynthesis. Uh, and um, and you and this network shows the effect of every gene on the trait of interest. And then knowing these interactions, actually, you can start designing pathways in a quite, uh, you know, targeted manner. And uh, here I would like just to show you some of the outcomes of uh, our work. For example, uh, a gene called CKX2 is the suppressor of the biosynthesis of the phytohormone cytokinin. And then if you knock it out, then uh, certainly you would have, uh, you know, it, it's a suppressor of, uh, and then if you knock it and knock out this gene then you'll get increase in the number of grains per head uh, or uh, for example uh, that has been done a while ago uh, if you, the gw 2 gene is invo involved in proteasomal degradation pathway which is suppressing the grain size if you knock it out then uh, you'll get increase in grain size and weight uh, or uh, for example, gene TGW7, it is connected with the grain size and weight uh, trait, and then uh, knockout would, for example, increase the grain width. And uh, actually, this is just the example how the networks that we develop by integrating multiple sources of genomic and genetic data together, uh, we can actually start identifying critical elements of the pathways that uh, underlie uh, variation in the phenotypic traits and then use this knowledge to design uh, to design these traits uh, using targeted uh, genome editing approaches. And in conclusion, so uh, we show that joint analysis of EQTL and chromatin accessibility data provides a powerful tool for detecting regulatory regions in the large width genome. Uh, and uh, we showed that uh, actually the information that we collect is actually relevant for uh, deciphering genome to phenome relationships and uh, added extra dimensions to the genome to phenome map. And uh, we show that by combining additional omics data uh, with the phenotypic trace, we can actually start uh, identifying uh, biological pathways that are uh, relevant for uh, the, that contribute to variation in these traits. Uh, and then the and this information uh, once compiled uh, could, could be used to improve our ability to predict phenotypic outcomes of uh, particular uh, particular genome uh, and or the select genomic targets for uh, engineering uh, desired traits. And in the end, I would like to acknowledge uh, acknowledge uh, first of all, of course, members of my lab, uh, Catherine Jordan, who did tremendous amount of work on developing chromatin accessibility uh, map. Um, uh, Catherine has now joined the USDA now. She's a, a geneticist in USDA. And uh, Faye He, who uh, actually drive for all our bioinformatical analysis, uh, unfortunately, will be leaving us soon and join, 
uh, joining uh, institute as faculty in Beijing, uh, and uh, Wei Wong, who lead uh, our the gene editing efforts in our group, and uh, uh, and of course other members of the lab who uh, contributed a lot uh, for the, these things to happen. Uh, and uh, of course, I'd like to acknowledge the uh, remaining my colleagues and the funding agencies, uh, for, for especially USDA for funding WheatCap. Uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation uh, that uh, actually helped us to set up the genome editing uh, platforms uh, for wheat, uh, and the International Genome Sequencing Consortium uh, for providing early access to genomic data, uh, and then and thank you for that. So um, and uh, with that, I'd like to finish my talk, and then I'll just leave these slides uh, that actually show some of the links that uh, I showed during my talk. Uh, uh, but surely you have you'll have access to these uh, slides, uh, but you can download my presentation. And with that, I would like to finish. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Edward. It was a great presentation and <clears throat> a great description of all the work that you you've been doing. Uh, we do have several questions that have come in. Just a reminder to everyone, please input your questions into the Q&A panel and we will get to them, uh, get to as many of them as possible. Uh, the first question, when CKX2 expresses or when does it express? Is it when the number of, of flowers, for example, the ultimate number of grain is decided on or how long before flower initiation? Do you have any idea uh, to that? Okay, I see. Uh, well, unfortunately, I don't know that information. Uh, so we didn't perform analysis uh, specifically, uh, but I'm sure that there should be somewhere in the literature that there are some, some studies where uh, where, where the gene expression profiles were characterized, but I, I'm not sure whether it was characterized at such a high, uh, you know, time precision, like it's, it's just a time result at that level. Um, no, I, I, I don't have an answer to that. Okay. Um, could you please give some insights about chromatin accessibility in the context of the 3D architecture of the genome? Well, uh, yes, so essentially uh, we did this analysis, we did compare uh, 3D contacts that were published recently in genome biology with the open chromatin states, and there is a substantial overlap between those regions that are in contact and the chromatin accessibility. So yes, so the, the, these, these two data sets are quite compatible. So, in, in also in the context of the development in space and time? Uh, well, we have only uh, once, one specific time point. Uh, I don't know how much uh, wheat chromatin accessibility changes over time. However, studies in maize actually showed that it doesn't really change that much. Uh, and uh, I would expect that um, that it will be the same, but uh, surely it would impact certain subsets of genes that uh, whose regulation do depend uh, strongly on uh, chromatin, uh, well, actually driven by changes in chromatin accessibility states. Uh, but um, but I, I don't think that the, 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 there are like global changes that are happening in chromatin accessibility uh, across the development. All right, uh, what tissue types were analyzed for the chromatin accessibility? For chromatin accessibility, we analyzed two tissues, roots and shoots, two weak siblings. All right. Uh, did you investigate what is in the non-coding regions where you find EQTLs, um, perhaps the transcription factor binding sites as well? I. Uh, well, there are uh, there are QTL that are located within open chromatin and located in the intergenic space, pretty far away from the genes. Uh, we do find them, uh, uh, and uh, but the, the, this is something that probably somewhat similar to distant cis regulatory elements that were identified in maize, where they also showed that you may have a regulatory element that located sometimes megabases away from the gene. 
uh, and uh, having open chromatin, having EQTL. Yeah, we, 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 do, we do find them. Yes, but I just didn't have time to show this data uh, and it's relatively recent. Uh, yeah. So how do you discriminate between resistant chromatin versus highly sensitive chromatin at the highest MNAs concentration? Uh, you know, unfortunately, it's not very clear what's the question, but I'll try to answer. So essentially, the differential chromatin accessibility is the calculated by uh, taking the ratio of the depth of coverage that you get uh, uh, by comparing the, this light and heavy digest, and it will be one score, but it is the ratio, like uh, how much of, uh, what is the difference in the depth of read coverage uh, with the different uh, levels of MNAs digest. And then this actually does allow you to, uh, you know, there are some regions of the chromatin uh, that are really open and ex easily accessible to digest and could be digested even with the lowest concentration of MNAs. Uh, uh, whereas uh, like the, the regions that are a little bit more close, they could not be digested, but they could be digested with the heavy digest, which actually blow the entire chromatin into the nucleosomal units. And then by comparing the relative, uh, relative, uh, you know, the, the digest, you actually calculate this uh, differential chromatin accessibility score. Um, well, I, I hope that I answered the question. <laughs> I think so. Um, so the next question is: You mentioned the use of chromatin status to improve the GS models. How are you suggesting to do that? By, I mean, well, what, and then the question continues. So, uh, by using the chromatin accessibility map you've developed, or by using developing, using or developing a genotyping tool that's sensitive to the chromatome status, chromatin status. Uh, well, I think that uh, everything depends. Uh, you know, genomic selection models uh, can actually work perfectly well within the breeding program that is using. Uh, you know, any breeding program is based on a relatively limited number of uh, uh, founders, and then the uh, level of LD is very high, and therefore you can actually capture the uh, you know, genetic effects by using a relatively modest number of SNPs. And uh, in this case, the information from the chromatin accessibility probably will be. Uh, you know, as good as actually the, the modest number of SNPs that capture these LD patterns. Uh, but if you go to more and more diverse panels where LD drops very quickly, then uh, prioritizing uh, SNPs, uh, predictive SNPs that would have uh, high predictive power uh, using chromatin accessibility data would be useful. Uh, uh, I don't think that um, there is a need in developing specific chromatin accessibility assay uh, to run in the breeding programs uh, because, as I said, that it's very likely that chromatin accessibility doesn't change dramatic, dramatically and globally uh, uh, from accession to accession. It's more like a local changes, but I don't think that it has a, like a global effect. So uh, probably a uh, few centralized genomic resources that provide this information would be sufficient to filter SNPs and selecting uh, most, uh, but hopefully most predictive ones for genomic selection. All right. Uh, <clears throat> the next question uh, refers to your research, to the paper that you published. Um, and in that, there are clear peaks for DNS scores that can be seen in the centromeric regions. What do you think is the possible reason for that? Well, uh, DNS actually, well, differential MNAs digest, uh, I think it was used in uh, some of the modal systems for uh, looking at the uh, centromeric chromatin. And then centromeric chromatin have this uh, quite unique structure with the, you know, it's, first of all, of course, it has uh, centromeric histone, it's, uh, it's an H3, then, uh, which actually, when it's folding with the DNA together, it actually forms slightly different, um, uh, you know, chromatin with different period periodicity, and then uh, likely it also affects the way how the, you know, how accessible this chromatin is. And it does look like that 
uh, that this, this conformation of chromatin in the centromere, uh, you know, there are some regions that could be still accessed by the uh, light uh, digest. Uh, and that's the result why you, we get this peak. Um, so uh, it's, it's mostly related to, the, to the, uh, this unique uh, uh, chromatin organization of the centromere itself. All right. So the next question is, do the epigenetic profiles of synthetic wheat significantly differ from natural strains or varieties? Uh, well, we haven't done this analysis. Uh, well, uh, and, and it would be interesting to, well, there, are some, there are some work that, that was done by Anthony, uh, Maybe uh, this may provide some clues, um, but I would expect that probably it does have impact on uh, overall chromatin accessibility, mostly because of this genomic conflict that you have uh, with the new, newly coming uh, genome that trying to uh, establish uh, regulatory interactions. Um, but surely we we don't have the experimental data for that. All right, now we're going to get into a question regarding CRISPR. Um, do the CRISPR lines or CRISPR modified lines, are they considered GMOs? Well, according to USDA, not yet. Uh, according to European regulations, uh, yeah. Um, so, well, Surely, the, per se, after removal of the CRISPR-Cas9 construct, uh, the, so they, are, they, are, they are not genetically uh, modified organisms uh, because the only thing that you have left in the genome is a scar uh, that, that you get after editing, uh, which may happen uh, naturally uh, almost at the same site. And essentially, there is no way, well, it's very difficult to distinguish the genome edited one from the natural variant. So, I hope that yeah. that would be my No, I think you answered it. It's, uh, it's to be seen is probably the best way of thinking about it from the standpoint of the regulatory well, uh, framework yeah, international. Matter. Yeah, matter of how the community will define it, and uh, essentially, we scientific community need to work with public to uh, develop a proper uh, language to describe this uh, this kind of genetic material. Right. Well, Edward, that's all the questions that we have for today. So thank you again for a fascinating uh, talk and for the work that you are doing. Uh, I want to again. Uh, thank everyone for participating in our webinar today and for posing some interesting questions. And we look forward to seeing you at our next webinar series. Again, we've been joined today by Edward Akinoff from Kansas State University. Thank you all for participating. Bye-bye. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Bye.